No, I guess I'll sit here. That's fine. <laughs> okay, thanks for joining us today, both our audience and our panelists. So, my name is Nora, and I'll be moderating for today's roundtable. I'm part of the Occidental Persuasion Club, and as you know, today's event is sponsored by Oxys Persuasion, which is a club dedicated to the proposition that we as a community should reach each other and affect positive change in a kind of persuasion that is endorsed by open dialogue as opposed to coercion and violence. So, Mr. Davis, you have used your music to persuade KKK members to renounce their terrible views which is an endeavor that aligns with FAIR's mission. So could you please explain how you've used music to persuade your fellow citizens to transform themselves for the better? Sure, I'd be glad to. <clears throat> well, you know, as a, as a band leader, when I'm on stage, as a band leader, it's my job to foster harmony between the different instruments, whether it's the trumpet, the piano, the guitar, the bass, the drums, the saxophone, or the, or the vocal voices. I want harmony there. And anytime that I want dissonance, I will inject it into the music for effect. But not if I don't inject it into the music. If the dis thank you very much. If the dissonance happens randomly, then it's not music, it's noise. Somebody hit a bad note or went out of tune or something like that, all right? So the only time you want dissonance is when you intentionally put it in the music for effect. So naturally, as a band leader, if I'm trying to bring harmony on my stage between the different voices, be it instrumental or vocal, when the gig is over, <clears throat> excuse me, I step off the stage, I want harmony around me in society. So it's a natural thing for me to try to foster that harmony. And uh, how, how music works is like this. Say, for example, what, what's your name right here in the front row? I'm sorry? Jean? Oh, Jenny, okay. So let's say, for example, that um, tomorrow is Friday. Usually I have a gig, but let's say I don't have a gig. So I'm off. So rather than be the entertainment, I want to be entertained. I'm going to go out and hear a band or find some music. I want to do some dancing. So there's a club down the street. Maybe they have a DJ. Maybe they have a, ba a live band. But I want to go hear music. So I go to this club, I want to dance, the dance floor is full, there's a good song on, and um, <clears throat> I want to dance to it. So I look around to see if I see an unattached a woman that I, I can dance with, and I see this lady sitting at the bar by herself, and she's patting her hand on the bar top in time to the music. So obviously she likes the song. I don't know her, but I walk over and I say, hey, you know, would you care to dance? She says, yeah. So she comes off the bar stool, we both go out onto the dance floor, and we're dancing together. I don't know her. Now, if it's a slow song, we have our arms around each other, and we're slowly turning around on the dance floor. If it's a fast song, we're apart, we're shaking, whatever. And at the end of the dance, I escort her back to her, to her seat. I thank her for the dance. I say, by the way, my name is Daryl. And she says, my name is Jenny. And... Um, I say, so Jenny, what do you do? And she says, uh, I'm, the, uh, I'm the vice president for, uh, for West Coast marketing of uh, Microsoft. Whoa. You know, she's making $500,000 a year. Okay? And she says, so Daryl, what do you do? And I say, um, I'm a cashier at McDonald's. So what am I making? Maybe eight or $9,000 a year? Where would two people that far apart on the spectrum come this close. And I don't even know her. Music, music. Everybody likes music regardless of your political belief, your religious or non-religious affiliation, th this color of your skin, your ethnicity, your, your culture, your sexual persuasion. We all love music and music has that power and that's how I use it, to bring people together. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Mr. Bartning, you found it fair, which has generously brought Daryl Davis and Mr. Marshall here today. So, Mr. Marshall, you have found FAIR's mission to be one with which you can sympathize. 
So could each of you please introduce yourselves and tell us the motivations behind joining FAIR and founding FAIR? Sure. So um, I was particularly excited about FAIR for two reasons. Firstly, uh, they are a there's they they are a civil liberties group that actually uh, stand for the what I, I as a British person would call liberal, but I think it has a different meaning in this country. Uh, liberal values, uh, as espoused famously by the great Martin Luther King, who once said, we should judge people by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. And um, I, I, I think that there's a problem with other civil liberty groups in this country. I won't slam them too hard right now, but I could. Uh, and uh, they've gone uh, astray. And I think that there's an important need for it, uh, for such a, a group. And then within the music industry, uh, let me give you an example. Um, when the George Floyd killing happened in 2020, the music industry unanimously decided to put up a black square and support the Black Lives Matter organization. And as we know, they raised $90 million, which they're spending in... Well, anyway, that's another question, another topic. But uh, the point was that it was quite explicit from the beginning that the Black Lives Matter organization were a Marxist, anti-family, anti-capitalist organization. And for those of us in the industry who want to stand against racism and proudly stand against specifically anti-black racism, and we were forced to support that particular organization, I think that was a problem. And I think there needs to be organizations like FAIR so that when those types of incidents happen again in the future, which is sadly inevitable given the human <laughs> experience, uh, uh, human nature rather, uh, that there needs to be real organizations that aren't divisive and that unite among, uh, along those liberal, British liberal, classical liberal uh, uh, beliefs that, that I hold myself. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Bartning, would you like to enlighten us the motivations behind founding FAIR and the mission? Sure. First, I just want to say I'm uh, really uh, excited to be here. I graduated from Oxy uh, a long time ago, and, uh, and it's really great to be back on campus. Um, you know, my, my personal values are, are very much in line with, uh, with I think, the values that, that are reflected in, at Oxy, and I think that Daryl Davis um, uh, holds, and that Martin Luther King, and that many, many great leaders um, uh, have espoused. And I, and I think those values really, you know, came, I think, in, in some way out of my experience at Oxy. Um, when I came to Oxy, there was a, a focus on multiculturalism. And that was part of what attracted me to this school. Um, I, I think that I wanted a, an environment where I had people from all over the world, from different cultural backgrounds, um, coming together uh, in celebration of, of what we have in common and also the, the differences that make us all unique. So, um, so that's really my value system. Um, what, what I found, and the, the reason why I started FAIR, is that um, is that what has become popular in anti-racism is antithetical to what I believe, to what I value. And, and let me just explain what I mean by that. The, um, my kids' school in New York City um, rolled out a new anti-racist curriculum that, um, when I dug into it, really concerned me because the, the curriculum was based on, on the premise that um, everyone belongs to distinct racial groups. Um, so it was reinforcing racialization of people. And, and it was defining people's identity based on the race group that they were assigned to. For me personally, that was an issue because I'm, I'm mixed race. My father is Mexican and Yaqui. My mother is Ashkenazi Jewish. And you know, I always felt that made me a pretty normal American. I mean, I think it's, it's more and more common for people to have mixed ancestry. And so this insistence that we actually need to resegregate ourselves and see ourselves as inherently different and defined based on you know, these, 
really superficial characteristics, um, you know, to me seemed like it was taking us backwards and not forward. And so the, the basic concept behind FAIR is, is to champion a positive vision, um, you know, which I think really Daryl Davis um, articulates so well, which is, which is for us to all be pro-human. And what we mean by being pro-human is, is that we, we really want to see ourselves and see other people as unique individuals who are united by our shared humanity, not see ourselves as interchangeable members of identity groups. Um, we, we are all genetically distinct, but we share 99.9% .9 of our genes with every other person on this planet. And so for, for us at FAIR, that's really what, what we see as, as the solution to racism, as the solution to intolerance, is to really remind ourselves that we are all part of one human race. Thank you very much. Now, Ms. Katiti and Ms. Sibonet, like Mr. Davis and Mr. Marshall, you are artists and you're involved in visual arts. So could you please each introduce yourselves and tell us what sort of connection or intersections you see among art, persuasion, and the prospects of persuasion in the liberal democracy such as ours? Well, um, thank you so much for having us, and this has been lovely. Um, I, man, arts is a journey. I think a lot of people can relate to the persistence that you have within the arts. Um, you, is anyone else here an artist? People in the arts in the room? I see a lot of hands going up. Awesome. Are there times where you feel like this is not it? This work, this piece of work that I'm in right now, I need to throw it in the trash because it's not doing it right now. I relate a lot of my journey and process in art, especially when we feel like giving up, to how we are as humans and how we relate to one another. And oftentimes we might be um, in tension with one another with different groups. We might be going through a period where uh, it's easy to blame uh, certain groups, um, but as art, Artists, I think we have to remember from our own process, our own journey, uh, that we don't give up, that we get better. Um, actually, as I'm saying this, I realize that this is something Salome just talked about. <laughs> and I think that's where I'm getting my inspiration from. She recently uh, tweeted that just like uh, art has mistakes, um, human beings have mistakes and we can all grow. I think, yeah, yes. that's actually, yeah, that was you. Thank you, sis. <laughs> Well, I'll take it from there, I guess. Is this on? Do you hear me? Okay. What a great jam session, first of all. Got to give it, that's hard to follow. It's really good. So I am Salome Sibone. I'm a writer, artist, and cultural critic. And like you were saying about art, it's a really analogous um, experience creating a piece of art to creating a society, to creating relationships. and. I'm really focusing lately on perfectionism in art and our intolerance for the imperfections in others. So just like when you create a piece of art and you have that moment where you think this is not it, this is terrible, this is very bad and I should hide it and quit. Being able to tolerate that discomfort and move forward is actually where you gain something new. And in a society where we're all free to express ourselves, there's going to be discomfort. That's not actually a problem, it's part of the process. And it's learning to navigate that discomfort in a way that doesn't actually lead to destruction, something far more uncomfortable that is what keeps a society moving towards genuine progress. In my work, I like to focus on the creative experience and how as I become more tolerant of my own imperfections, my own flaws and the flawed pieces of art that I create, the more I can see other people's flaws, not from a place of judgment or fear, but from a place of understanding that this is part of the human experience. And I think art is something that we can use as a process of understanding how messy and complicated the human world is. It's not something that's going to be perfect. We're going to encounter bad ideas. We're going to encounter people that we don't like. 
the beautiful thing about being pro-human is not dehumanizing people when you have those experiences where you encounter people you dislike or ideas you dislike. And as an artist, you try to find the beauty in everything, even the messiness, even the ugliness. And when you can do that, it expands your view so that you don't get narrowed down into this really tribal us versus them mentality that is so easy to regress into. Thank you very much. And now, Mr. Cooper and Mr. Wood Jr. Both of you are concerned with politics and policies. So could you each please introduce yourselves and tell us where should we go from here? What is or should be the role of persuasion and open dialogue in our political society? And where should we move as a political community? Is this on? Yeah, it sounds like it is. Um, I just want to thank you all for having me. This is my second time to Oxy, which I think is enough to make it a second home. So I'm going to go with that. Um, my name is Bertrand Cooper. I am a writer and researcher. Most of my work has to do with poverty, um, which was the state that I grew up in, um, and just really influences everything that I try to do in writing. I love the question, <laughs> by the way. Um, I think it's an excellent idea to put the idea of persuasion, the act of persuading people alongside the idea of a just society. Um, I think if everybody kind of reflects on their life and thinks about situations in which the person on the other side of you had no obligation to explain their thoughts, no obligation to explain the rationale. They didn't have to persuade you at all. You know, what are your earliest experiences of that? For a lot of people, it's going to be when you were a child. We don't hold that adults have to explain anything to children they're not obligated to. And after childhood, then you have, if, you know, maybe some of you were lucky enough to escape it, but if you ever worked a menial entry-level job, say a restaurant, you got to experience again a situation in which someone on the other side of you is not obligated to explain the rationale. They're not obligated to persuade you of anything. Now, in the case of the parent, it's benevolent, hopefully. In the case of the employer, less so. But in the situations where the person on the other side of you doesn't have to explain anything, they don't have to persuade you of anything, there's a hierarchy there. You're not equals. That's why they don't have to explain anything to you. And it's, it's great that there's been a lot of references to Martin Luther King. You know, when I think of what I've gotten out of Martin Luther King Jr.'s work, it's so much about his work about love and community and really showing the different types of love. Um, you know, uh, it's a concept I think about a lot because I uh, grew up very poor and pretty, pretty easy to be callous. Uh, an unfortunate paradox of a hard life is that instead of it making everybody empathetic, sometimes it makes you go, well, if I made it through, then everyone else can. Something that I really appreciate about MLK was the concept of love for folks where it's separated from affection. Uh, I won't butcher the Greek, I'll leave that to Jake to do correctly, but a form of love where you just care for other people because they're people. If you think about the situations, contrary to the ones I started with, the situations where you will do everything you can to explain your point of view to somebody, where you feel obligated to, where you feel obligated to persuade them, those are our equal relationships in life. Those are healthy relationships. Those are our partners, those are our friends, the peers that we really care about. Most of the conversation about explaining yourself, about persuasion, its value in an open society has to do with the intellectual merits. It's how you polish ideas, it's how you have creativity, and all of that is true. But when you're willing to explain yourself to someone, when you're willing to persuade them, there's an emotional aspect, which is that you're showing that you care about them that you're equal. That's why you're extending yourself. That's why you're making yourself available to them. That's why you're trying to persuade them. And so when I think of a just society, I think of a society where there is a maximum of equality, where we are all equal. And so persuasion, explaining yourself, that would be an act that happens very frequently in a just society because I care about you and because I want you to understand where I'm coming from. I want you to tell me where you're coming from, and I'd like to persuade you, because if I'm not persuading you, the other option, it's all antagonistic. So um, I think persuasion has a big role in an open society and a just one. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Wood Jr. Indeed, thank you very much. And uh, 
it's great to be on the stage here um, with uh, some old friends and new, uh, and to be here talking with all of you. Uh, I'm national ambassador for an organization called Braver Angels, uh, which happens to be America's largest grassroots bipartisan organization dedicated to the work of political depolarization. And I, I tend to like to deepen that explanation by saying that what we are really committed to is reviving the communal fabric of American democracy. Uh, I also happen to be a, an opinion columnist for uh, USA Today. <clears throat> but the, um, the, the health of civic society is something that is certainly reflected in our capacity for persuasive engagement. A society, a democratic society in which we feel no particular obligation to engage in a project of mutual reasoning together because your political party, perhaps your, you know, your ethnic group or your occupation or what have you, makes somebody who makes you somebody who is not necessarily sort of, you know, worth engaging on the level of sort of, you know, political or intellectual uh, equal or moral equal. Um, you know, while the, while the lack of that capacity is reflective of a greater sort of, you know, sort of anemia in our body politic, the, the core sort of uh, deficiency there is a simple lack of trust existing between, between human beings. What Bertrand was getting at, and which I, th what I think sort of has parallels uh, to uh, part of what uh, uh, Daryl was talking about earlier, music's ability to sort of transcend, is really this transcendent quality of, of goodwill. Um, and that was at the heart of Dr. King's teaching. The philosophy of nonviolence rests on this idea, I, I will go ahead and butcher the Greek merchant, um, this idea of agape love. It is a love that does not require our liking one another, but that does require us to basically signal to folks with whom we have differences uh, that we mean them well. And so Dr. King believed in this idea of a beloved community. And he said that in explaining not philosophical nonviolence, he said, we do not seek to defeat or humiliate our opponent, um, but rather to win his friendship and his understanding so that we, be, we may be reconciled to one another in the beloved community. The thing is, our distrust for one another as individuals extends to our distrust of one another as groups, and it extends to our distrust of institutions. Many people are of the opinion that democracy suffers today because we can't agree on a common set of facts. But if the fact of the matter is that I distrust, let's say, the mainstream media because I believe that they are co-opted by liberals who I think want to grow government simply for the Per point and purpose of stealing my rights because ultimately they hate America, this country I live in, or, you know, I distrust the, the, the corporations or the Republican Party because they're run by white people with privilege who are part of a larger system of white supremacy that denigrates my humanity and therefore I should not trust that institution because I don't trust the groups of people and the categories of people who I see as driving the agenda in these institutions. Well then of course there's no basis for persuasion to take root because there's no fundamental sense of trust which says that somebody who disagrees with me is coming from a place of goodwill or this institution that's supposed to be serving me is something that's actually serving the common welfare as opposed to the interests of a particular group. We have to start at the very beginning and sort of reassert the idea that each of us has an axiomatic sort of obligation to try and signal goodwill to folks who are different from us, not as an immediate pretext for reaching agreement, but as a pretext for being able to say, okay, we may disagree, but we can look at each other as fellow human beings who ultimately have the same interests in living in a society in which we can flourish. I mean you well. That doesn't mean I'm right, it doesn't mean that you're wrong, but it means there's a basis for conversation that can begin from there. And as long as we try to skip that part of it, that part of our civic culture that, like music, transcends the differences in our political stands, then we will always find ourselves chasing our tails in the vain pursuit of intellectual and political political agreement when we haven't even started from the point uh, of, of recognizing a common humanity 
in each other that allows for us to have these conversations in the first place. So we need to go a level deeper in our moral commitments to each other. And that begins with embracing that philosophy of nonviolence, that agape love, that goodwill that drove Martin Luther King. Thank you very much. And another loud round of applause for our amazing panelists. Now she'll begin our Q&A portion of the round table, so do not hesitate to ask your questions. And Gabriella will be walking around with a microphone to assist you. Yeah, hi, I'm Gabriella Knudsen. Um, I'm the treasurer of the Persuasion Club. Um, first of all, thank you again to our panelists and to the Jazz Ensemble uh, and all of you here. Um, if you have any questions to ask our panelists, just let me know and I'll bring the mic to you. Um, I'm wondering, um, you know, Brian, your story about your kids at the school. Um, I'm wondering if you can explain, and given, I forget what your name is, but your idea of the agape love and the recognition of our common humanity, sorry, uh, you know, public speaking, I gotta get out of my heart's beating. Um, what would you say you know, because I've also had this sense of sort of outrage when I read about, you know, some of the practices. I don't know how widespread it is, like, you know, putting kids into racial groups when they're in grade school and stuff like that and reinforcing this idea of racial identity. Um, but I'm wondering, what are they trying to get at that's good from their perspective? So I know there's a lot of talk about, um, you know, I mean, I've been doing a lot of reading. I went to college in the 1970s, so this is all way after my time, but about, you know, um, postmodernism and all of the stuff that happened on college campuses in the 90s with identity politics, all of which was after me. Um, and I'm just wondering, what, were, what are those people, the Derrida's and the Judith Butler's, and what is it they're trying to get at through this sort of identity politics, the critical race theory. Can somebody explain that to me? Like what, what, everybody thinks they're usually working to make the human race a better place. So even though I don't, I think the tactics uh, of some of the cancel culture and you know, this kind of um, scary suppression of free speech are, is very scary, but the people doing it think they're doing a good thing. So what, can somebody explain what they think they're trying to accomplish by this uh, sort of um, idea of privilege and racial groups and all that stuff. I don't know if you can, but I've been doing a lot of research and I'm still slightly confused. <laughs> I'm gonna actually ask Kimmy to answer that because I think she's very good at explaining this. Oh man, oh that's <laughs> so tricky. Um, so uh, thank you so much for that question. What what are they trying to get at? Is that the question? Like, what is their goal? Right. Um, yeah, I think something that you, you talked about, Salome, I'm a huge fan of Salome. Um, there's a lot of Salome quotes gonna happen. But um, uh, I think it's important to understand that Sure, they're aiming for good, but the premise is a little bit skewed. So when we're talking about humanity, a lot of the critical theory uh, uh, talking heads um, and authors from back in the day, um, they operated on defining people by groups and by their groups having a certain amount of power. And I think where they miss the mark in trying to level the ground for everyone um, in the study of like sociology and how we interact with one another is how humans react to feeling oppressed by a group that possesses power. Um, I think they over they overlook the fact that um, it, it might not be true in all cases. Uh, let me break this down in a little simpler sense. There is a definition that that says that racism equals prejudice plus power, right? Has anyone ever heard of that definition? So how does it operate on an individual level? Because that might work to say, 
okay, collectively, if it was 1950, a group of like black individuals will have less institutional power than white groups and individuals. But in 2022, how does that work? How do we say that black people as a group do not have power, therefore on an individual level, I do not have power? Like, how do we calculate that? If there are any, like, I know, Nora, you're doing math, so you can maybe, <laughs> um, a formula or something. But no, it's, it's nearly impossible. And I think that's what they missed in giving these broad sweeps of, okay, this group possesses power, this group is at the top, therefore it is okay to be prejudiced against them. They miss the mark that on an individual level that eats us up inside as humans. Um, I also think there's an overlooking of just gleaning data from history. What happens when one group focus on, focuses on enmity instead of common humanity? Um, there tends to be cycles of violence. What happens when we try to look at um, working together and seeking harmony, just like Daryl Davis says, we tend to gel together and eventually get over our misdeeds of the past and build a better future. Uh, for me, that example was living in post-apartheid South Africa in the 2000s. I can definitely say that there was a potential for retaliation because that one group held incredible power over another group. But because of the leaders like Desmond Tutu, leaders like um, Nelson Mandela, they were able to look at common humanity, definitely address that common enmity and say, don't do that, do not punish, do not retaliate. We're going to focus on amnesty. We're going to focus on forgiveness. And therefore, they were able to work together. So I think critical theory people, they want justice, but the premise of groups just inherently having power is where they miss the mark. And that leads us to common enmity, not common humanity. Jump on that just because I'm chatty. And not to contradict anything there, but just to hone in on um, the one part of your question of, you know, what do they hope to get? I want to say that they... I agree with everything about the problem of their premise, but they were answering a specific gap that for any of us who are liberal or left, we can look up politicians that are today liberal and left, and we can, if they've been around for a few decades, we can see their position on gay marriage and where that was even just a few years ago. Within all of these marginalized groups that, um, you know, we're voting Democrat, we can see decades in which the people who were at the marginal spaces, the people who were liminal, the people who had, um, say, were marginalized within other groups, the mainstream of the liberal group or the mainstream of the Democrat group, it, it wasn't prioritizing solving their issues or their problems in life. So critical race theory could have the wrong solution, but they have a solution and, and it's, it's not enough just to say, and I know that you're not stopping here, um, but it's not enough for any of us to point out the errors in their thinking, which I'm happy to do and have done many times on Twitter. We also have to have our own solution because they are addressing a real problem out there. That's why these ideas take hold. I mean, it's, it's very hard to find even people today who are staunchly liberal left it's hard to see it, find a single quote um, from them about you know uh, being trans in the 90s. It just wasn't one of the talking points. So there were a lot of people um, who were invisible and needed someone to you know speak to their issues. Thank you. Hello, um, I have one question. So there's this kind of popular concept of intersectionality and kind of a hierarchy of intersectionality uh, that kind of usually places, you know, white men at the top, and then as you go down, you go, you know, uh, African-American women are tend to be towards the bottom, LGBTQ, like if you're LGBTQ, African-American woman, there's this idea of intersectionality where kind of the, um, the higher, the more uh, marginalized groups you're a part of, the uh, farther you land on that hierarchy of intersectionality. So the, the one issue I have with it is that it instilled, or in my opinion, it instills the idea that some people in this country, the system is designed to work not in their favor, that they are basically bound to fail or at least 
uh, deal with significantly more challenges than other people. So given that this is a really popular concept today, what advice for any of you, really, can you give to inspire people who are in these marginalized groups and who are told that the system is working against them? How can you inspire them? What inspires them to uh, basically uh, power through that and achieve what they want to achieve? I would answer that question first, and I'd say be very suspicious of anyone that tells you that you are set up to fail because that is someone that you might want to question whether they're on your side or not. That's not something that I would ever tell anyone that I cared about. Um, that's not something that I would tell my child, that the system is set up against you. I would uplift what they are good at. I would try to help them develop a perspective that sought out their opportunities, not that sought out their obstacles, and that prepared them for the inevitable obstacles that we all have in life. I'm very suspicious of anyone that sells cynicism. I don't think that that is a productive or healthy outlook for any individual. Um, you're going to be met with obstacles, absolutely, and life is unfair, this is true. And this goes to Bertrand's point that there is a desire to answer this question of why there is so much inequality and unfairness in life. The problem is real. It is good to point out the problem, but there are many solutions that we can choose for any one problem. And um, if someone is trying to sell you an outlook that's going to ultimately make you miserable as the solution, I would question that first. I might uh, add into that, uh, I agree with you that uh, yes, there is uh, systemic uh, racism and inequality in our country, and, but we can surmount it. It depends upon how we do it. It definitely exists. You know, when, when, um, when I'm in high school, uh, I'm not taught that even though I may be class valedictorian or I may get straight A's or whatever, uh, and I'm a good student, that when I leave high school, I may not get hired. Uh, simply because of the color of my skin, and somebody who is a lighter color uh, will probably get the job even if they're not as qualified as I am. You women, when you're in school, uh, you're not told, you're not taught that when you leave school and you get a job, you may be sexually harassed by your boss. But you all know it happens. So a lot of these things are not taught, and they smack you in the face when it happens, you're like, oh my God, how do I deal with this? You know, I wasn't expecting this. I worked hard to get this job, and now I'm being told I have to do this and do this in order to get a promotion, right? These things are not taught in our school, but they are reality. Yes, they are built into the system. So we have to address that and learn how to overcome it. And yes, they can be overcome. And this is one thing where, where fair comes into play. Um, <clears throat> my friend Winston here mentioned the, uh, the George Floyd incident. and um, let me, let me say something about that. I, I've been doing this work for almost 40 years. And, you know, what I've seen uh, in the last 40 years, well, even more recently, uh, you have uh, Charlottesville, you have Rodney King, you have um, uh, Black Lives Matter, Trayvon Martin, these things. You see all these, all of a sudden, all these groups start popping up and they want to fix the world. And a lot of them, you know, are very passionate about that. A lot of them don't have the experience to go about it, and it's like a trial and error with them. So I, <clears throat> over the last 40 years, I've been approached by a number of groups to, to join them, this, that, and the other. Uh, I, I align myself with very few, and FAIR is one of the ones that I do align myself with because they do have the values. They do know how to, how to surmount these problems, and it's that common humanity. We all up here may agree that we need a pro-human approach. We all may have different ideas about how to get there, but we all are on the same page and we work together. You also mentioned Black Lives Matter. Let me get to that in a second. Um, <clears throat> George Floyd. Before George Floyd, this country was very divided, okay? And then um, George Floyd happened. We saw a lynching live on the internet, on TV. We watched it go down in real time, all right? Um, people were home during George Floyd. Why? Because of COVID. You know, they couldn't go, go to work. Their businesses were boarded up or told to stay home or whatever. So what do you do when you're home? You watch TV, you browse the internet, 
and you see somebody being lynched by police officers, right? <clears throat> in the past, let's go to yesteryear, let's go to, to the beginning of the civil rights movement with Dr. Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. Let's say 1955 with the bus boycott, okay? No, Dr. King organized that because buses were not treating black riders properly. He organized it with Rosa Parks along with some white people who saw the vision and believed in it. They marched with us, they boycotted with us, all right? And as a result, a year later, the bus situation was rectified, not just in Montgomery, Alabama, because other states were watching. And they said, oh no, you know, um, we better change our rules too because Dr. King will come to our state and do all this. So it had a snowball effect, all right? Um, when the powers that be, that's the power structure, when they saw all these protests, it's mostly, they saw mostly an ocean of black people with a smattering of white people mixed in, white people who got the vision, right? And because there were so few white people, they could try to shut us down. We still progressed, but, but the pages of progress turned very slowly. Now, let's fast forward to 2020, George Floyd. When that happened, what did the powers that be see? They saw an ocean of black people out there protesting along with an ocean of white people protesting because these white people were at home watching TV, browsing the internet, and they saw this man losing his life for no reason. And they said, oh my God, you know, I gotta do something. And despite the risk to their own health during a pandemic, they came out and marched with us for the first time in the history of this country have we had that balance of black and blacks and whites marching for the same cause. And as a result of that collective protest of blacks and whites, we saw the pages of progress turn a lot faster. While, <clears throat> while those protests were geared predominantly at police departments, there was an, an even larger ripple effect that took place in this country. Police began getting arrested, charged, and convicted a lot quicker. 20 years ago, Derek Chauvin, you wouldn't even know his name. You would not even know his name. He would have gotten away with that, as would many, many others, as they have, okay? But now they're being arrested, charged, and put in prison. Also, um, the Confederate uh, flag was banned from NASCAR. NASCAR has been ground zero for the Confederate battle flag. And that's why I said, enough's enough. You can no longer bring that flag on this property. The state of Mississippi, I should say the sovereign state of Mississippi, removed the Confederate battle flag out of their main state uh, flag. Whoever would have thought we would see that in our lifetime? Mississippi, all right? Food brands changed their labels. Aunt Jemima, Uncle Ben changed their labels, okay? That is the result of collective protests. That is the result of everybody seeing the common humanity with what happened to George Floyd. And that's what we cultivate here at FAIR. We bring people in from all walks of life, all right? Uh, in terms of, um, of Black Lives Matter, <clears throat> Black Lives Matter is not really an organization as much as it is a, uh, a movement. Um, so therefore, it doesn't really have chapters. It has what are called factions. FAIR is an organization. <clears throat> um, policy is created by the FAIR administration and all chapters around the country follow that same uh, policy. That is an organization. A movement, you have factions of different um, people using the same name, like Black Lives Matter, et cetera but each one may be a little different. Some are more aggressive uh, and want to go out and, and paint BLM all over the place. Uh, others want to sit down with the state legislature or the county council and work out legislation to bring about change. The problem is <clears throat> when the media uh, does a report on them, let's say, uh, where are we here? We're, we're in Los Angeles. So let's say the Los Angeles chapter of Black Lives Matter sits down with the, um, with the LA County a legislature and tries to draft bills to, to do certain things, all right? Good, 
but let's say the, um, the another chapter next door, uh, say San Francisco, whatever, that, that chapter goes around and does uh, destructive stuff. What the media says is Black Lives Matter did. They don't say the LA chapter did, or the LA faction did this, or the San Francisco chapter did that. They just paint a broad picture. So it's, it's, uh, it's not as, as informative as it should be. That's because it's, it's a movement. It's not a, an organization like the Boy Scouts of America, the Red Cross, the NAACP. Whatever policy is at headquarters is the same policy all around. And that's what we at FAIR do. Like he mentioned, uh, he, he didn't go into detail about some, uh, some mis mishandling of uh, funds with Black Lives Matter. That's because there's no organization. Sorry. Sure, absolutely. I respectfully disagree with some of what you've just said. Absolutely. So I, uh, I agree that uh, the vast majority of the Black Lives Matter uh, was a movement of the people who weren't really aware of the organization, that were deeply uh, sympathetic with the plight of black Americans and wanted to show solidarity and did. And uh, it was a, there was a positive nature to that. However, there is an organized BLM centralized organization as well. They collected $90 million in that period. $30 million of that was spent on the Wall Street. A large portion was spent on their own private property portfolios. And they've also spent a decent amount on various trans-related charities which have nothing to do with black people. So I do, I do agree that there is uh, absolutely, uh, a l I would say the vast majority of people don't even really care about the organization. Uh, uh, the specific central organization of Black Lives Matter started by Patrice Khan Cullors and others. Uh, uh, but th there is and was a central organized, very uh, uh, specific organization. They were clear about their, uh, their aims. Uh, they, they had them on their website, although they changed them various times throughout. Now, it's, a, it's nuanced, so this is where, where I think we have shared ground, because I, I support the feeling. Uh, uh, like you, I, I, I was shocked by that video. I don't know anyone who wasn't horrified and moved to tears by that video. And I don't know anyone who, I uh, genuinely don't know anyone who isn't sympathetic to uh, the, the plight of black Americans. I do. You, oh, okay, yeah. Okay, you do. <laughs> I, I, I work point. with them every day. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, but, but the point I'm, I'm rather trying to make is that, yes, I agree that it was a huge movement of millions upon millions of people, most of whom weren't aware of the central organization, but that there was also a central organization, and that was the point I was trying to make. I later. think, yeah, I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying. The central organization came later, though, because Patricia Cullors uh, and the others did not want to trademark the name Black Lives Matter, and that's a problem. Uh, it was born in 2013 in the wake of the Trayvon uh, Martin murder, all right? But they did not want to trademark the name. They wanted it to be organic. And at the time, 2013, you know, they could not foresee George Floyd. They had no idea how big BLM would become because now as, as, as because, because of, of it not being trademarked, you can go out right now and start your own BLM. I can do that. Anybody here can do that because nobody owns the, the, uh, the trademark BLM. But if someone were to go out and, and try to start a fair chapter without his permission, they could be sued and stopped. So that, you know, there, there's a difference. Yeah, can, I, can I weigh in with um, sort of what, what, what I would sort of describe as the, 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 the high level takeaway that I hope folks um, bring home with them uh, from this conversation and this, and this topic. Um, you know, Dr. King, of course, has been referenced a number of times here. And, and the, uh, the, the question that was asked earlier, I thought, is a very important sort of place to focus. What is it that motivates the people that we would seem to disagree with, right? Um, the truth is that you know, there is uh, incredible inequality in America that exists as a function of history, the workings of institutions, um, Bertrand would do a better job than I would in terms of representing the statistics. 
<laughs> but you know, I mean, if we're just talking about the African American experience, you know, we have this, you know, we have a, you know, a prison population uh, in this country that extends uh, into the millions. You have across classes, uh, even among people who earn the same amount of money within class groups in American society, you know, fractional sort of tremendous differentials in terms of the amount of wealth they hold overall. You have all these material differences, greater a disproportionate number of people communities of color and Af the African American community in particular, living not just in poverty, but in multi-generational poverty. But if you put aside the statistics, there is just sort of the social experience that people have of moving into new environments, moving upward in the institutions and finding that the way they wear their hair isn't something that you know people necessarily you know accept as normal in, 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 the, in the boardroom, that the dialect that they're used to speaking isn't something that's considered to be you know professional, the new environment they find themselves in. And so people enter into this sense that society is culturally, socially, and structurally designed to be against them from many different vantage points, sometimes from a deep experience of material poverty or violence or deprivation that may not affect all black people, but affects disproportionately many, disproportionately many Latinos, indigenous Americans, or you might be somebody who doesn't suffer from that sort of uh, an experience, but you still find yourself out of place in mainstream institutional society. The problem with the culture of anti-racism and social justice that is sort of pervasive in the mainstream and in some respects is you know, demonstrated in much of the activism of Black Lives Matter, grant, granting the complexity that, that, that Daryl was, was referencing, and you know, the, the culture of anti-racism as it is inspired in many respects by critical race theory, which is an academic subject unto itself. Um, but the main problem I think many of us see is, the is not the fact that inequality is pointed out and identified as something that has to be engaged, but that the way in which people respond to that is to therefore reduce people to very simplistic categories on the basis of their privilege. So as to say that because this inequality exists, because we have the social friction in the context of our institutions or the spaces we show up, therefore I can make concrete judgments on your right to speak at a conversation owing to your level of privilege, owing to where you fall in a demographic spectrum, in this sort of inverse sort of you know, uh, hierarchy or in this hierarchy uh, of, of power and status that, that Nick referred to earlier. And the problem with that isn't that, you know, in the great sort of aggregate, there's not at least a half-truth in that, right? Because there is a half-truth in general terms. If you're white in America, if we zoom out and look at the big statistics, on average, you're going to have more, more wealth than if you're, you're African-American. On average, you're less likely to be incarcerated. All these things are, are true in this big general abstract. But as soon as we get to talking about individuals, all bets are off because all of our experiences are unique and different. And of course, who we are in our characters and our personalities, right, is something that you can only know through conversation and persuasion. And we give ourselves permission not to engage each other on that level when we are content to operate on the very little that could be gleaned about the people in our lives by their associations uh, with, or by their, by their being a part of some superficial category, right? And so to the extent to which that way of thinking has permeated a fair amount of activist culture in American life, it has made it very unpersuasive for anybody who's already not in that mode of thinking, right? And I think that that's really the thing we're getting at. Um, we can, but it is very important, I think, to look at the things that motivate the people who disagree with us, right, in terms of approach because it would be malpractice on our part to say there's no truth to any of that. There is. The question is, can we develop a pro-human approach to dealing with these problems and build common ground in the effort to create a more equal and a more just society? I wanna just, oh, okay, jumping in. Still on the intersectional question, because in a way I am a, a poster child, at least for part of this question, so. Uh, my dad went to prison for murder about three months after I was born. He was a blood gang leader. My mom um, had a substance abuse issue that really took hold when I was about 14. Um, and I actually uh, ended up leaving the state of Florida illegally just to escape being placed in a boy's home. Um, they never looked for me. Uh, 
but I went through all of these steps that are associated with really the stereotype of black poverty. And um, when I was 18, I took the SAT, and uh, this was 2005, 2006, which is actually a year that the uh, Journal of Blacks and Higher Education has on record. Um, I took it once, and this was on my third high school. I scored well over 700, I think it was like 744 verbal. The Journal of Blacks and Higher Education will say, for that year there were about 1,200 black identifying students in the entire United States who scored over 700 in either section. My guidance counselor mentioned nothing to me. Nobody said anything to me. Crickets. So after that, I tried to go to college. Didn't know anything about financial aid. My dad just, he had gotten out of prison when I was 16. I was living with him and he was just insistent that somebody uh, in his family, somebody who was his kid was gonna have to go to college. So I was temporarily living with him and he said, you either go or I'm kicking you out. So I applied to one school, got into one school. It all went down in flames because neither of us understood anything about financial aid. And when I would go to the financial aid department, I was the only teen there by themselves. Everyone else was accompanied by a parent who was gonna navigate all of these forms for them. Things like this continue for me for the next eight or so years until I'm 26. And I do eventually get out of poverty, but along that journey, everything that might have helped me typically did it. And in the midst of that, while I'm working, I would get phone calls, say, from like my mom saying that her boyfriend is beating her and she'd like me to come through. And of course, if I do that, it's just going to be two black dudes fighting in the street in Camden, which is often, you know, uh, noted as one of the most dangerous cities in America. It's not going to go well for me. That's probably going to be the end of my academic career. So I just don't go. And this has a very harsh um, alternative version for me. Um, hopefully some of you will be familiar with the story of Breonna Taylor. Part of why the police were checking her house is because she was the sort of person who held money for a friend who was the person who was called uh, to pick somebody up from county. I was that person for my friends until I slowly cut everyone off, until I was really just alone with regard to anyone from my past life. I didn't know where my mom was for three years. So now all the way on the other side of it, I'm here on this stage with you know this illustrious panel and people very often ask me, you know, are there any tips, are there any secrets? How can you get out? And I mean, the answer is that it is possible. It took me until I was 26 and it took militancy and it took a willingness to just really exhibit some very inhuman features, to not pick up my mom's phone calls, to not talk to friends, to really cut people out. The allure of intersectionality as a discourse is that it recognizes that what I had to do to get as much as someone else who has the same skills and knowledge as me was, by any human measure, much more difficult, much more challenging. Far fewer people would have been able to do it, but intersectionality is bleak, it is pessimistic, it does eventually connect to a discourse that I really dislike, Afro-pessimism, which says there's no hope. So since all of you are here, presumably, because you care about persuading others, you need a discourse other than intersectionality, something that recognizes the tension there, that society at present does have these roadblocks. It is hard, it is not easy for everyone, but if you just sit around and wait until everything changes to try and improve your life, you will probably waste your life. There's a tension there. I would never tell someone not to try, but you have to tell them to try while acknowledging that it is not fair. Yeah. So, awesome. Uh, thank you everyone for coming out uh, once again. Uh, Thank you again to our co-sponsors, FAIR, to our wonderful panelists, to our wonderful musicians, and to Occidental College for providing us with the space. Our panelists have modeled the ethos of FAIR and persuasion in the way they've been able to disagree deeply with one another while still remaining respectful and indeed friends. Uh, I just want to quickly add that Persuasion Club meets um, Fridays 5 to 6 p.m. every week in the um, Lower Herrick lawn tent, not Lower Herrick, the Lower Herrick lawn tent. I keep, I keep getting that confused. Uh, we discuss everything from philosophy, politics, psychology, sometimes even mathematics, uh, everything under the sun. If you're interested and you want to swing by, you're very, very welcome to join us. And thank you for coming out.